All right, we're gonna read one of Neville Goddard's lectures. I am in complete agreement with what Neville says, with what William Blake says, and the Eastern idea of God, because I have actually experienced this myself, and that is how I came upon this information. I didn't learn this information and just believe it. So here's a disclaimer. I didn't just read this stuff and say, oh, it sounds good, I believe that. I've actually experienced it, and I know that it's true. So, this is from 1970. <clears throat> Tonight is a bit of a riddle, but you listen carefully, for it's very, very important. It is the morning star, a promise made to man. He who conquers, I will give him the morning star. Revelation 2:26 26 through 28. Then, in a realization of this promise, he identifies himself as the morning star. He says, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. The Bible ends on this note in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. So he tells you that he is the root and the offspring of David, that he is the morning star, that which he promised to the man who conquers. Again, let me remind you, when I speak of man in the Bible, I speak of generic man, male and female created he them, and called their name man. Genesis 1.26 So it is to you whether you be male or female that he speaks, and he promised you himself. Now, he tells you he is the root of David and he is the offspring of David. Here we find three generations. We find the grandfather, which is the root, the cause. We find the father in the form of David. And we find the grandson, which he doesn't name. He says, I am the root and the offspring. So he identifies himself with the root which is the grandfather, and calls the grandson himself. So he is the grandfather and the grandson. Now, who is the son of, that is David? The grandfather and the grandson are one. David is the son. David is the symbol of humanity. So we have as our root Jesus, for this is Jesus speaking. My root is Jesus, and Jesus unfolds himself creatively in me. Now, what is that that is unfolding within me? It is Jesus. Well, what comes out of humanity? What comes out of you? What comes out of me? He calls this in scripture, his creative power. In scripture, the creative power is defined as Christ. Christ, as we are told in the first chapter, the 24th verse of 1 Corinthians, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So this comes out of you, for your root is Jesus. And what comes out of you is one with the root. And the thing called humanity is what is known in scripture as David. David means beloved. If you took all the generations of men and all of their experiences and fused them into one grand whole, that whole scripture calls eternity. Scripture calls it the world. Now we are told in Ecclesiastes, he has put eternity into the mind of man, yet so that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Ecclesiastes 3.11 so the whole of humanity and all its experiences are in man, but man will not find it out until the end. Now when you take all the experiences of man and all the generations of man and fuse it together, when it comes out personified, it's a youth, and the youth is David. The world is called Alam in Hebrew. It's translated as eternity. It's translated as the world, yet it is more often translated as the youth, as the stripling, as the young man. But you can't see that the young man until the very end. He has promised me. He has promised you. He has promised everyone himself. 
for he has promised me the morning star. And what is the morning star? It's the symbol for eternal life. Now he tells us, what is eternal life? And this is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God. John 17, 3. When you find God, and you'll not find him in an, any other way than one way, for no one has ever seen God, but the Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. Only when David stands before you, and he doesn't have a, to say a word, as he stands before you as though memory returns, as you look at him, this relationship of father-son is beyond all doubt. There is no doubt in your mind as to who he is. At that moment, memory returns, and the whole thing is so clear, as though in the beginning you knew it, and deliberately went to sleep in the forgetfulness of the eternal son that is your son. But you will not find David until the very end, and when you find him, he calls you father, and David is the son of God. David is the symbol of humanity, and all of its generations fuse together. It comes out personified as the eternal youth called David. In the fourth chapter, of the book of Acts, the writer who was also the writer of the book of Luke. For all scholars agree that he who wrote Luke also wrote Acts. The unknown writer of Luke is also the unknown writer of Acts. But here in this fourth chapter, now turn, O sovereign Lord, creator of the heaven and earth and the sea and all there is in it, who by the mouth of thy servant David, our father, did say, and now he quotes the second psalm, Why did the Gentiles rage and imagine vain things? Then it goes on in the same second psalm, and these are the words, and David now speaks, I will tell of the decree of the Lord, he said unto me, Thou art my son, Today I have begotten thee. Psalm 2 verse 7. It is so clearly stated. Now in that same passage that I just quoted, they translate a word that is more often translated as son. They call it in this passage servant to confuse the issue because they cannot believe for one moment having taught through the centuries that Jesus is the son. And now when it comes to David, they call him the servant. Yet that same word in the same chapter is translated son or child. So why change it? You miss the point completely. David is the eternal son and you. When Jesus unfolds himself within you, you are the Lord. You are the father. So here I am rooted in Jesus. Jesus is my root, and Jesus unfolds himself creatively in me. And when he completes the work in me, I am he. And when it's completed to prove that it is completed, David appears, and David is my son. Now, he said, I have come only to fulfill scripture. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. And beginning with Moses and the law and the prophets and the Psalms, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. Now, in the 89th Psalm, the Lord is speaking and the Lord is saying, I have found David and he has called unto me. Thou art my father, thou art my God and the rock of my salvation. Psalm 89, 20 and 26. He has come only to fulfill scripture. That is the purpose of life. What a man does in this world, it makes no difference to scripture, whether you are a carpenter, a mason, a scientist, a doctor, a speaker, it really doesn't matter. That doesn't concern the writers. They were not writing secular history. They were writing salvation history. It hasn't a thing to do with secular history. Whatever you want to be, you can be by a principle laid down in scripture, but that means nothing to the writers of scripture. Listen to these words of Paul. 
from here on I regard no one from the human point of view. Even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view, I regard thus him thus no longer. Did you hear that? Even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. This is the secret of scripture. He does not deny the physical you. That doesn't concern him. His only concern was the life, death, and resurrection of the Christ in you. For that's the creative power of God and the wisdom of God. And that has to form itself in you to complete that passage I quoted in the beginning that comes from the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright morning star. And he who conquers, I will give him the bright morning star. In other words, I will give you myself. Well, now David in the spirit calls you my Lord. As we are told in the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke, David in the spirit calls him my Lord. Well, every son spoke of his father as my Lord. So who is your father, he asks. And what did he answer? He said, my father is he whom you call God. And I know my father, and ye know not your God. Now David stands before the insane king. His name is Saul. That represents the world. The world that has forgotten. The world that now suffers from amnesia. For man has completely forgotten who he is. He doesn't know he's Jesus. If I told you now that you are the Lord Jesus, you would think, Why, he's silly. That's perfectly silly. Here I am making a profit in this world to pay rent, to buy food. And he tells me that I am the Lord Jesus. If you had a billion dollars today, but you didn't know it, you could die of starvation for the want of a dollar, if you didn't know it. You wouldn't go into any bank that held your reserves because you would not know you had it there. You could be dispossessed from your home, not knowing you could buy the home. You could be dispossessed from society, not knowing you could buy it all if you didn't know you had provision. Well. That's what man is. Man is suffering from total amnesia. He has forgotten who he is. For the root of man is the true identity of man. And the root of man is Jesus. And Jesus unfolds himself in man. Well, what does he unfold? His own creative power and his wisdom. And then gives to the man in whom he unfolds himself. He gives himself, for he is the morning star. When Jesus gives himself to you, his son must appear and call you father. Then, and only then, do you know that you are the Lord Jesus. No loss of identity, no none whatsoever. Only a far greater you now appears. You are Fred, John, or Mary, or whatever your name is. But now you know as no one knows, because they are still without this true identity. It hasn't yet returned. They are still suffering from amnesia. So you do not tell them. You do not boast. You simply walk the world, seemingly alone, because the unknown being that has come to everyone in the world, who has accepted him in faith, and they speak of him as Christ, but the Christ of faith comes to us as one unknown. Yet one who knows an inevitable mystery lets man experience. Only as you experience Christ do you know who you are. When you experience Jesus, you know who you are. In no other way do you ever know it. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal it. Luke 10.22 I could tell you from now to the ends of time that you are Jesus, that you are the father of the immortal biblical character called David, and you would shake your head and wonder if you were really all there. Why do I come and listen to this? Because it seems so insane. 
And I am telling you an eternal truth, but spiritual truth, which is the eternal truth, cannot be logically proven. You have to wait for it to reveal itself within you. I can tell you, and the day will come, that all I have told you will return to your memory, and you will know I have told you the truth. But when it comes to you, it is because the Holy Spirit has been sent. He is called the Rememberer in the Bible. I will now depart, he said, and that's man's darkest hour, when he becomes invisible. And darkness covered the earth because the Lord became invisible. Well, where did he go? He went into the tomb. The tomb is called in scripture Golgotha. Golgotha is the Hebrew word for skull. So when the Lord is buried, he becomes invisible and he enters Golgotha, the human skull. God himself entered the skull and shares visions of eternity with those who are there until they awake. And they awake one day to find they are entombed. And then they come out of that tomb, and all the imagery of scripture surrounds them as a cubic reality, not something in the distance. They are cast in the central role. They are the being called Jesus, without loss of identity. You are still Mary. You are still John. You are still whoever you are when this thing happens. Then all the imagery, the witness to this thing that happens to you, it all takes place before you, within a cubic reality, just like this room. And how different the cubic reality is from the plane of any depiction of it. Oh, I can depict it in a picture, on a script, or I can put it into the form of a piece of scripture. But how different the cubic reality from the pl plane of any depiction of it. Right now, this room is so real, isn't it? Why is it real? Because we are here. Yet this room is not as real to you as the home you left. The home you left is more real than this because you visit this so seldom in the course of a year or a lifetime. Yet every night you go home. But the home that you now think of is a plane. It hasn't this reality. It hasn't this cubic reality. Why? Because we are not in it. So... When this play unfolds within you, you are in the play. You are the central figure in the play. And it's just like this cubic reality. And the men are objectively real to you and everything about it is real, just as this room is real. Prior to that moment, it was simply something that happened 2000 years ago. No, it is happening at every moment of time in the imagination of man, which is the reality of a man. Well, when it happens in reality, it takes on this form, the form of a cube. So here, the morning star, as told in scripture, is Jesus himself. And I, Jesus, said unto my angel, Go and say, I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright morning star, and he who conquers, I will give him the morning star. He will give us himself. Well, if he gives us himself and he is the father, then where is my child? I can't be a father unless there is a child. So show me my child. Well, I've searched the scriptures and it tells me the father's son is David. So I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. At the very end of the journey, I have begotten a son. As the resolute state of my journey, through all the states of humanity, I pass through every state, good, bad, and indifferent. And having experienced those, the resultant state of these experiences comes out as David. And David, in the spirit, calls me father. So, what think ye of the Christ? He asked. And they said, Why, the son of David? He said. then said, Why then did David, in spirit, call him my lord? If David thus calls him my lord, how can he be David's son? They did not answer. They did not know the mystery. So when David stands before 
the insane man symbolized as Saul, a king who had forgotten. He had lost his memory, and he had promised to give the man who destroyed the enemy of Israel to set that man's father free. He is not going to set the man free. He's going to set free the father of the man who destroyed the enemy of Israel. And now here comes the man, and he holds the head of the enemy of Israel, symbolized as Goliath. And here is a head. He holds it in his hand. And King Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? For he had promised to set that man's father free. He wants to find the father. Whose son are you, young man? And the young man answered, I am the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Jesse the Bethlehemite. Well, the word Jesse means I am. It's any form of the verb to be. What he actually says is I am the son of him whose name is I am. Well, that is God's name. And the Lord said unto Moses, When they ask you for my name, say, I am hath sent you. This is my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. So that's my name. So Jesse tells you the name of the father of David. For he's asking this question of David. And David answered, My father is Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now we ask the question. A lady asked me tonight before I took the platform. Why all the confusion in the world? Well, man is set free to make all the mistakes in the world. But having made them, he will reap the consequences. Because man will do the will of the Father. Man is David. David is the symbol of humanity. Now is that stated in scripture? In the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Humanity has done all the will of God. Well, you say, wars too? Yes, man imagines war. He will do the will of God to go to war. For God will compel him to perform every act in this world that he has imagined. We do not have a complex in this world that runs over $13 billion a year. And then not sell the profits of it. Russia has a similar setup. And they sell between 12 and 13 billions of the same items. Sweden is a neutral country. And they run into billions and they are neutral, criticizing us. Switzerland has an enormous factory producing the same things. England has the same thing. France, the same thing. And I am speaking of war materials, but all the production of the factories that produce only for wear. Pull it, they put it all together from all the nations who have the know-how and the ability to make it. And it will run into billions and billions of dollars. We confess to selling every year in excess $13 billion in war materials to the outside world. Not only what we keep for ourselves and use and stockpile, but what we actually sell to the outside world, we have competitors trying to outsell us. Russia is our biggest competitor. England is not far behind for a small country today. France is there. Switzerland. They all do something. All these countries who can make things. And they are all now asking for peace. Not one wants to close their factories. They would like us to close our factories so they could sell more, not less. Each is competing with each other in the making of war materials. And they are asking, why war? Why do I make bread? Because people will buy it if I publicize it enough. I do not want to make all kinds of bread and not sell it. I would have to go broke if I didn't sell it. So I make bread based upon the consumption of man and my ability to persuade him to buy my bread. Well, there we come to the very basic root. You find it true in everything that we produce in the world. If I can't dispose of it, I must stop producing it. So to ask me why we have war, go back to the imagination of man. He conceives the item. He conceives the use of it. And then he brings in his name to advertise it. And then sends out his salesmen to sell it. 
and that's why we have war. You can't go on stockpiling it, going more and more broke in these poor countries and not use it. And so whatever man can imagine, man can realize. And so we will realize it. It's just as simple as that. But man does the will of God. God didn't will him to go to war. He gave man freedom of choice. We ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We are told to choose good, but the choice is ours. We can choose evil. When man chooses evil, he is under compulsion to express it. So I have found David, the symbol of humanity, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And so God puts him through the paces to express what he himself has chosen to express. So that's the whole vast thing in this world. If we want to stop it, we don't stop it on the outside. We stop it on the inside. But in the very end, you'll discover you have played every part in the world. You've played the part of the harlot and the part of the one who sat in judgment and condemned her to death. You have played the part of the thief and the one who was the victim of the theft. You've played every part in this world, the peacemaker and the war maker, and in the very end, having played all the parts that and the journey is over, you come to the end. And then the end is a reward, and that is the morning star. And the morning star is the gift of God, himself to you. That was the purpose in the very beginning. This wasn't something thought up afterwards. It came in the very beginning. God so willed it, that in the end, having suffered for the thirst in the very beginning, is for the God that became invisible. So God is telling the entire story as told us in the book of Genesis. In the very beginning we were told we are going to go into a world that is not ours and we will be enslaved there 400 years. Well 400 years is not 400 years measured by the clock. 400 is a symbolic number as all the numbers in scripture are. 400 is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet symbolically. Its numerical value is 400. Its symbolic value is a cross. And that cross that God wears is the human form. It is on this cross that God is crucified. That I know from my own personal experience. For when I reenact and replayed the 42nd Psalm that night that I completely reread it. Leading an enormous crowd in procession going into the house of God. 42nd Psalm. He led them in procession to the house of God, and then he remembered. And these things I remember, and how he led the gay procession. And this night in question, I had this enormous crowd, all in Arabic costumes, and the men, and here I am leading them to this invisible home, the home of God. And a voice out of nowhere rang out, and God walks with them. A woman at my side, at my right, asked the voice, If God walks with us, where is he? And the voice replied, At your side. She turned to her left and looked into my face, and became hysterical. It struck her so funnily that she was looking into a man's face, that that man was God. So she asked the voice, after looking into my face and becoming hysterical with laughter, she says, What, is Neville God? And their voice replied, yes, in the act of waking. Okay, I'm going to stop it right here. I'll probably make it.